hi to the people that join already. We are gonna wait a couple of minutes to uh, see if more people joins and then we will get starting. All right, so should we get going? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for joining all of us, uh, all of you, this is great. Um, yeah, this is the third webinar of our series, the extension agent of the future. And the topic today will be trade-offs and synergies between the different extension delivery models. Um, yeah, before I pass, on into our moderators who will give a small introduction on the webinar. I'm going to introduce myself shortly. My name is Berta Ortiz and I am the coordinator of the community of practice in data-driven agronomy. I'm, I will be here to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So if you have any technical issue, please reach uh, to me. And uh, I, would, uh, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can put them in the question and answer box and please not in the chat box because otherwise it becomes a little bit difficult for us to manage them. And the last thing I would like to say is that the link of the recording will be shared through our social media channels and on the webpage of the community of practice. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Daniel Jimenez, the leader of the community of practice on data driven agronomy. I'm very pleased to see you all attending. And just to remind you all that this community of practice operates under the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. And the, one of the main goals of the, this community of practice is facilitate and communicate collective action around topics related to data driven agronomy. So just a little bit of context in late two, 2020, and as a result of previous activities carried out by this community of practice, we proposed to the community to elaborate on a topic related to how the extension agent of the future would look like. So in that session late last year, we had like more than 300 people partic that participated and interacted around this topic during the Big Data in Agriculture Convention. And we got like dozens of ideas on which angles aspects should be explored. So this year we're organizing several webinars related to this topic. We already talked about the access and the tools accessible to different cultures and languages. And today we will talk about the delivery and what are the trade-offs and synergies between the deliver, different delivery models and, and working with farmers groups, as uh, Bertha already said. Um, this is a subject that I really love because the CGIR, the organization that, uh, that, uh, that we work in, in which we're working right now, uh, it has a long story working in participatory research, uh, group-based approaches, but actually since late uh, 90s, we have not heard uh, actually too much, uh, that much about it. So we know that the principles established might be useful for digital extension. Actually working through groups of farmers is one of the main recommendations that it's been um, recommended by the different communities and groups working for in um, extension advisory services. So it's, um, now I'm, I'm sharing this moderation with, with, with David Gerena. I'll stop there and I'll hand over to, to David so he can introduce himself and the topic and our speaker, uh, Steph Anston. Thanks, Danielle. 
Uh, yeah, my name is David Berena, and I work with uh, Daniel Jimenez and Berta Ortiz on the, the data-driven agronomy community of practice. And as Daniel was saying, uh, the topic that we're discussing today relates to trade-off and synergies between different delivery models of ag extension. And, and the thoughts here are with moving towards digital, um, it may be that we're losing sight of some really important tools in agriculture extension meaning basic face-to-face uh, -face or group-based in-person delivery models. Uh, but of course, you know, we, we know that we get a lot of benefits from some of the digital um, components. So what, what would be some of the trade-offs uh, of switching from one model to the other model? And are there potential synergies of integrating both models together? So based upon that, we've asked uh, two um, speakers to join us. Um, the first one is Dr. Step Aston. Uh, Step is leads the or directs the research ag research piece and components at the uh, One Acre Fund, and One Acre Funds are really a, a fantastic uh, model for agricultural development and have a huge uh, footprint with ag extension in Africa. Uh, we're also waiting for Shreya Agarwal of Digital Green. Um, she confirmed her participation, but we're still waiting for her. So hopefully, she'll be able to to join before uh, we finish the webinar. Other than that, uh, Step, would you? Please take the stage. Sure, thanks, David. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, oh, good. Technical issues already, it's a good start. All right, are you seeing that? Cool. Um, so, yeah, Great. Um, I, I won't uh, spend uh, too long um, on intro. David's kind of explained who I am, what I do already. Um, and I, I imagine quite a few people on this call already have uh, some idea of, of what One Acre Fund is and what we do. Um, but just briefly, we're a not-for-profit uh, serving 1.3 million farmers across eight countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, delivering an integrated bundle of inputs and training uh, on credit with market facilitation. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about what we do, check out our website, but I'm going to um, yeah, try and spend the time focusing uh, on the topic at hand. Um, so I wanted to start off by giving um, a bit of context um, on kind of the, um, yeah, mobile phone ownership and use, network accessibility, smartphone ownership, and so on. Um, in the areas that we're operating in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, because that's going to color a lot of what I'll be talking about in terms of the potential um, for digital extension um, and, and some of the limitations over the next few slides. Um, and I think it's worth being clear as well that lot, this context obviously is going to vary a lot um, depending on what um, smallholder uh, agriculture market we're describing. So um, probably some of the kind of uh, case study conclusions and, and takeaways that I'm going to present here um, may not be equally applicable um, to, to smallholder agriculture, you know, in, in Asia uh, and in Latin America. Um, and, and equally, um, some of what I'm going to say may not be relevant uh, even to that kind of segment of smallholder farmers in, in Africa that's kind of a, more of a sort of pre-commercial um, stage um, of development. Um, the farmers we serve are very much primarily subsistence farmers. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the situation that we're dealing with. Um, so the data on this slide are a combination of uh, World Bank data, ITU data, and our own data. And I just wanted to, to pull out a few key points. Um, first being that mobile phone ownership is, is definitely not ubiquitous. Um, I think it's sometimes uh, assumed that that is the case. And while uh, here you can see that we have got um, over 95% ownership of mobile phones in Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia, and um, these are the kind of murky green color bars on, on this figure. In Rwanda and Tanzania, it, it's a lot lower, 60 and uh, 75%, and then way below 50% in Malawi and Burundi. Um, so we should not be making the assumption that uh, all smallholder farmers or even most smallholder farmers have mobile phones. That's highly spatially variable. Um, and then the bars in yellow here give you a sense of the percentage of the population using the internet. Um, 
which probably also gives you some sense of likely smartphone adoption, or at least the way those smartphones are being used. So in general, less than 25% of the population in our operating areas are using the internet. And that's true across all countries. Um, and in most cases, as you can see, it's much lower. And um, the only data where we've actually got uh, even half decent data on rural smartphone ownership um, is for Kenya. And adoption there is about 30 to 40%. Um, and I'll say a bit more later about uh, even interpreting what that means. Um, not all smartphones are equal. Um, so all of which to say, yes, the future for digital extension is incredibly exciting. Yes, it's a future we should be building for, but I think there is a risk that we mistake the future for the present um, and also miss the huge opportunities to deliver impact to farmers now with much simpler, more traditional technologies like paper, humans, radio um, and yeah also just basic feature phone channels like ussd sms and ivr um, all right let's move on so um if i only presented one slide today um this would be it um that if we're going to make the most of digital extension opportunities it's just vital that we start with the user in designing those extension tools um i think from some of the, the research projects I've seen that have attempted to um, develop digital extension tools, um, there's kind, kind of a, seemed to be this mentality of, um, we're gonna follow in Bollock's footsteps and we're gonna take it to the farmer at the end of the project. Um, uh, and I think we have to start with the farmer. We can't just take it to them at the end. Um, probably an obvious point, <laughs> but um, one that I think maybe doesn't get uh, paid enough serious attention. Um, so what do we mean by starting with the user? I think if, if we're talking about digital extension channels, we've got to think about who owns these phones, who can afford to use them regularly in terms of internet access, access to uh, electricity, ability to purchase airtime and so on. What's the level of literacy and their digital literacy? Uh, what languages uh, are they literate in? When are they using their phones? I don't think we can necessarily assume that um, all farmers will want to have their phones with them while they're in the field, um, or that they'll be always having them charged or switched on or, or checking them uh, regularly throughout the day. Um, and then also, what are they using their phones for? And um, so we know that for our client segment in, in Western Kenya, with um, smartphones or advanced feature phones, the most popular channels that they are using are WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, um, and I think there are probably some implications there for what effective digital extension might look like. Um, these channels are probably our kind of digital equivalent of, of a demonstration plot close to a market center with high footfall. Um, and so if you think about the outcome that you're trying to achieve, um, so for example, trying to you know, equip farmers to be better able to manage full armyworm, you might do better to launch an Instagram channel than trying to create an app that uses fancy computer vision and stuff to diagnose whether your crop is infested with fall army worm. Um, and yeah, okay, let's come back to this point about smartphones. As I was saying, it's kind of really important to uh, avoid the assumption that, that smartphones are actually smart. We can create these incredible apps that can do all sorts of fun things with computer vision, georeferencing, and so on. But a lot of the smartphones that farmers have right now, that 30% of farmers in Kenya, and as I say, much lower in, in any of our other countries, as far as we know, um, most of those smartphones are really not very smart at all. Um, they've got terrible cameras, often no GPS, fake Android operating systems, um, or really old versions, poor battery life, minimal memory. Um, uh, at least in many cases, I think I might have just said most, um, I misspoke, that, that's not necessarily the case, but certainly for, for many uh, smartphone owners, um, these phones just aren't that good. Often in practice, it's basically just a feature phone that happens to have a touch screen. Um, and so we need to make sure we are actually designing for that reality. Um, and besides all of that, we need to actually ask farmers what information or support they really need. And remember that they are managing farms, not just one agronomic variable on one crop. Um, another, I think, kind of trend I, I see is for different research programs kind of to, to produce some kind of digital extension tool that focuses on one agronomic variable on one crop. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe kind of misses the point that um, 
farmers are managing farms, they're managing multiple crops and multiple variables on those crops. And so we can't really expect to have much success if we're designing a different app for every single, every single agronomic variable on every single crop that a farmer has to manage. If they've got, you know, just for one crop to have one app for, to choose their variety, another one to choose their uh, basal fertilizer blend, another one to choose their top dress fertilizer rate, another one to diagnose one pest or disease issue and so on. And then for them to do that for each of their crops, um, clearly that's not gonna work. Um, and I, I don't think any of us really think that it would if we stopped to think about it, but often uh, the kind of implicit strategy in, in some of how these tools uh, are being developed doesn't necessarily align with, with the logic. Um, and then I think the other thing to say is just that, that we need to be really cognizant that the most important sources of agriculture information for farmers currently in our operating areas tend to be radio, friends and family, their neighbors. And they're also triangulating all of that with information that they're getting from their cooperatives or farmer associations or agrovets, local, local agronomists, maybe even TV. Um, and we have to recognize that digital extension tools are not going to be entering a vacuum of advice, but rather like a whole ecosystem of information sources that farmers might be drawing from. And we need to think really carefully um, about the implications of that. Uh, cool, next slide. So, yeah, uh, I wanted to touch briefly on this idea, um, which is probably obvious, that again, maybe a point that sometimes get overlooked, um, that farmers having the right information is just one small part of the adoption picture. Um, and I think in developing digital tools, um, researchers uh, sometimes kind of fixate on the information piece, which is obviously a natural and, and sensible starting point. But we have to remember that having the right information may just be one small piece of the behavioral puzzle that we're we've got to try and solve to support farmers to adopt a new technology or a new agronomic management practice. Um, so we don't need to spend too much time on this slide, but I've just listed out here um, 26 different behavioral modes of action uh, from the literature that we might need to leverage in order to support farmers to make use of the information that we're providing. And my point is here that knowledge is just one of these pieces. And in many cases, digital channels um, will be very effective in, in solving that knowledge piece and they may contribute and, and be partially effective for the other pieces, but I, I'd argue that they're unlikely to be sufficient on their own. Um, and so continuing kind of on the same, um, same thread, this is my attempt to uh, try and apply the trans theoretical model um, of stages of behavior change to agricultural extension. And the point I'm trying to make here is that um, digital extension can definitely contribute at each stage but probably to varying degrees of effectiveness relative to more traditional extension channels. So um, starting up in the top left in the pre-contemplation stage, um, digital extension channels can definitely help raise awareness um, of a product or a behavior, but they might be more limited in the contemplation stage where perhaps farmers need to see results that they can relate to or hear about from a few trusted sources like a neighbor who's already adopted the practice and had some success. Um, and then when they get to the preparation stage, continuing around this, this uh, circle, they're probably gonna need some, some visual demonstration of like, how do you actually do this? Which, okay, maybe you could try and deliver that through a video um, if you've got smartphones that are capable of doing that. But ideally, they'll actually get the opportunity to physically practice the behavior um, and build up some mus muscle memory of, of what this thing feels like to actually do. Um, and you might need to be able to, to link to local knowledge also with, you know, where can I actually access these inputs to, to do this behavior? Um, and also, as part of training, you might want to have the opportunity to get some expert feedback on, you know, I, I'm trying to adopt a new planting practice. Am I doing it right? Um, which digital is probably can solve, but it gets very complicated. Um, and then once they get to the action stage, again, there could be a role here for something like timely SMS reminders or critical crop management practices, but they might also need some troubleshooting support that, again, you can try and provide through a digital channel, but it's just hard to imagine that being as effective as local peer-to-peer, face-to-face participatory extension. Like, sure, we can try and use things like chatbots um, and 
we are trying to do that <laughs> a one acre fund but everyone gets annoyed with chatbots at some point um so yeah i think takeaway here in general is that uh these digital tools can definitely be com complementary and can add value but i do not think they can replace um to uh, the same level of uh, of efficacy, more traditional face-to-face -face participatory extension channels, um, at least not yet. Um, I can see that becoming more likely in a scenario where you've got a, a critical mass of farmers with smartphones and the ability to share lots of video and more interactive content. Um, but even then, I think people pr prefer to interact with other people um, than they do with screens. Um, Hopefully that's one thing we've learned uh, over the last year. Um, and so when we're dealing um, with, with very basic feature phones and tools like SMS, USSD and IVR, which is our current reality, um, the scope is much more limited thing. Um, and I think it's also important to think about the fact that even if you did have digital extension tools that were uh, completely as, uh, as effective as standalones and could in theory replace uh, existing extension networks, you've still got to find a way to actually deliver those tools to farmers and get them to adopt. And so you're going to have to build on some kind of existing extension network, most likely. Um, so, um, cool, right, I'll stop ranting on that. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I do want to be clear that, like, for all my uh, complaining about uh, digital extension potentially being a bit overhyped. I, I do think it's an area that there is huge potential for and one that we are definitely really progressively investing in more and more at One Acre Fund. Um, and I wanted to take a few minutes to talk through some more practical examples of how we've been using digital extension and how that's going. Um, so one of the first areas that we started exploring was um, the use of SMS to drive adoption of Lyme. And we started partnering with PXD, um, who were known as Precision Agriculture for Development at the time, um, on this a, a few years back. And this table presents um, some, some results from a couple of trials that we did um, with uh, using SMS to promote Lyme and compares them with the results from a different trial where we used more traditional marketing channels to try and drive adoption. Um, so just to be clear, we can't really make robust comparisons between um, the treatments and the data that are in these kind of brown boxes and those that are in um, the yellow boxes. Um, but I'm kind of gonna try anyway, because it gives us some, um, some really interesting comparison points. Um, so first thing to say is we saw some hugely encouraging results with uh, use of SMS, increasing adoption of line by five to 6%, depending on the like content of the message, which is an amazing improvement and incredibly cost-effective. Um, so the bottom row here shows uh, the SROI, uh, which is social return on investment, and that basically describes the additional units of farmer income generated per unit that we invested in, in a given marketing strategy. Um, so um, yeah, SMS, obviously incredibly cheap, incredibly scalable, and driving some, some real changes in adoption. Um, but it's worth noting that the adoption increases here, about half of those that we achieved um, when using field officers to market the product and then incentivizing them for sales. Um, and note as well that in this trial with the more kind of traditional approaches, field officers were dealing with a much tougher baseline adoption level of 2%. And okay, we can't make a direct comparison, but I, I think it's probably reasonable to suggest that we might not have seen such a big increase in the SMS trial area if it had been done in an area where the baseline was much lower because there would have just been uh, far less baseline farmer exposure to Lyme as a product. Um, and we've got some similar data also from Rwanda where we did the same kind of trial uh, and we had a baseline adoption level of 5%. And uh, we saw that SMS increased the likelihood of ordering Lyme by less than one percentage point. And um, that's not nothing, it helps. Um, but it's certainly not a game changer either. And maybe it's because in that context, there was a lower baseline adoption level to build from, um, or perhaps it just reflects um, instead or also differences in uh, responsiveness to digital extension from one country to another. Um, anyway, overall takeaway here is that digital extension can maybe be um, a much more cost-effective approach than traditional extension channels, but maybe actually kind of less 
effective overall in absolute terms um, for driving adoption. Another area where we, and I think the, the whole world sees enormous potential um, for digital extension um, is uh, improving smallholder yields through very spatially specific uh, real-time uh, advice direct to the farmer in response to real-time crop and weather observations and forecasts. Um, and the main thing we've made meaningful progress on uh, here so far is sending farmers real-time guidance on May sowing day, uh, building off of the TAMSAT alert system developed by Dagmar Wiasfor and Emily Black at the University of Reading under the TAMASA project. Um, late planting is, is a major maize yield gap in our operating areas. And on average across countries and seasons, we think uh, that yield gains of eight to 12% are possible if we can shift late planters to more optimal planting gates. And the figure on the left of this slide uh, shows the average yields achieved within our recommended window versus earlier or later from thousands of crop cuts across our countries of operation over um, three or four years, I don't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, this is a great example of where digital can play an important role, because obviously for this to work well, we can't be waiting on an extension agent to take several days or even weeks to work their way through an area advising farmers to plant. Um, and something like radio isn't going to really work either because it's not going to be spatially specific enough. So using SMS is, uh, is an obvious win in terms of delivering this advice to farmers in a timely and location specific way that probably just wouldn't be possible with more traditional extension channels. Um, but again, I think it's important to note that this advice still needs to be part of a much bigger picture. Um, so farmers aren't going to have prepared their fields for planting if we haven't also ensured that they've actually got access to inputs in good time. Um, and we also need to actually sensitize them to this guidance in some way and give them some context as to where it comes from. And we can't really do that effectively by SMS. So the impact that we're generating from um, these, uh, this yeah, digital extension approach really depends on us leveraging our network of extension agents and um, to get them to sensitize farmers to these recommendations and, and explain where are they coming from and build trust and, and understanding in the system. Um, I do not think we could make this work without that. It would just be an SMS coming from nowhere. Um, and, and we do have, um, Quite a lot of data as well where we've asked farmers um, about you know their level of trust uh, in these SMS guidance um, and it varies a bit by country uh, again in, in Kenya we see very high levels of trust about like 95 percent of farmers saying they really trust the recommendation um, but in Uganda and Zambia it's more like 75 percent um, and then when we ask them would you trust a recommendation more if it came via SMS or from your extension agent um, very consistently, the majority of farmers in all countries will say they would trust it more if it came from their extension agent um, rather than via SMS. And yeah, so some, some important implications there. Again, like I think we'd have no hope if the extension agent wasn't endorsing it to start with, but possibly also um, I'm quite interested in the idea of, well, could we actually make these recommendations appear to come from their extension agent? Um, Obviously, some, some ethical issues to deal with there, um, but, um, but ones that I think are solvable. Um, and so are there ways that we can kind of make scaled digital advice kind of more personal and therefore more, more trustworthy? Um, okay, uh, another obvious advantage of, of digital extension tools um, is that they can en enable us to simplify a lot of the complexity associated with decision-making. So instead of having to interpret stuff like this, um, to choose a, a maize variety that's appropriate for your context, an extension agent or a farmer can use um, a really simple decision tree uh, like this, where all of the complexity gets thrown into the, to the back end. By the way, neither of these examples were real. They're just very quick mock-ups for the purpose of this presentation, um, but hopefully you get the idea. And, and this is the, the, we are trying to do this kind of thing at the moment with USSD menus and uh, extension agent apps. Um, and it's great that we can simplify this way, um, but there is potential for us to lose some of the richness of participatory action if we just try and deliver this kind of recommendation direct to farmers without a fuller participatory approach. Um, so, for example, our uh, 
maze variety performance databases suggest pretty strongly um, that a, a certain variety that's really popular uh, amongst our farmers uh, around Katali and Western, Western Kenya would be consistently outperformed by another variety from the same company, which is much less widely adopted, um, but released more recently. Uh, but when we tell farmers that, some of those farmers uh, that actually have experience with this newer variety will tell you that they actually have a lot of problems with lodging with that newer variety that they didn't have with the older variety. And of course, you could say, okay, well, that's not a problem with digital extension. That's just a problem with your databases. And I guess to some extent, that's fair. We had actually done a, a few hundred on-farm trials with this variety over a few seasons, including in this area, and we'd never encountered this issue. Um, and so while we can definitely try to like uh, Im improve all of our systems and systematize and centralize this knowledge, um, as much as we can. I think we've also got to be mindful that it, it's always going to be difficult for an agronomy PhD with some awesome soil and rainfall and remote sensing layers and a bunch of georeference yield data and some awesome machine learning skills to consistently produce a better recommendation than all of these farmers with these their combined hundreds of years of experience of farming in their location. And so I think we need to find ways to combine those things and maximize the advantages of each and the synergies between them. Um, so yeah, this is kind of my uh, call, I guess, for a kind of uh, hybrid <laughs> approach to extension where we can kind of maximize the benefits, both of what farmers know and what agricultural and geospatial uh, and soil and meteorological experts know. Um, so, uh, yeah, on, on that point, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this in detail. Uh, and I see Daniel grinning. <laughs> he did not pay me to include this slide um, <laughs> um, or ask me to. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna spend too long talking about this, but um, just wanted to say that kind of the relative strengths and disadvantages of, of digital versus more traditional approaches are exactly why I'm kind of really excited about the potential of these more digitally enabled participatory research approaches like TriCart, Climob, um, because it can enable us to start making progress towards hybrid extension approaches that bring together the best elements of farmers' local knowledge and experience together with researcher expertise and data sets um, to deliver more optimal and appropriate recommendations efficiently and at scale. Um, so yeah, that's basically, all I wanted to say, but I'll, I'll just run through some takeaways here, um, which, yeah, are, are basically, let's start with the user um, and um, making sure we understand their capabilities, what they want, how they want it, um, and what information they're already ac accessing. Um, let's bear in mind that information is not going to equal adoption. There's way more to human behavior than just giving them the right information. Um, Yes, digital extension has incredible scale, uh, scale potential um, and, and may be much more cost effective than traditional extension methods, but it's not necessarily going to be more effective overall. And relatedly, digital extension cannot and should not be delivered in a vacuum. And the scale and impact of digital systems uh, is likely to depend on traditional channels anyway, so let's maximize those synergies. Uh, digital extension channels are uniquely capable of delivering time sensitive or spatially specific guidance um, at scale. No real downside there. Um, and then, yeah, kind of two more related points basically that we just ran through that digital can reduce decision making complexity, but it can't eliminate it or the need for really rich local field knowledge uh, of different contexts. Um, to, to really come up with optimal and actionable guidance. Um, yeah, and then basically my last slide again, let's use digital to en enhance farmer participation in research uh, and innovation and yeah, design better participatory digitally enabled extension channels. I'm done. Thanks, Deb. Uh I think we're still waiting on Shreya. So let's maybe dive into some questions uh, for you. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Shadea. She says, or he says, they say, 
my question to Step Aston is that in the case of Kenya, an SMS can still be used to substitute for those who cannot get smartphones. Your thoughts? So I guess the, the question here is, can um, SMSs be used to directly substitute smartphones? In certain contexts, sure. Um, so I, I think where we've got um, push information, um, like planting date um, recommendations that I was just describing, where there doesn't necessarily need to be a whole lot of interaction, um, then sure, you could just use SMS. But where we want to get some pharma input into the decision, then okay, again, you can still try and use things like two-way SMS at least, or, or even USSD. Um, but it does become much more difficult because you're much more limited in, in the type of content that you can present. Obviously, it all has to be text-based. Um, and, uh, and it's harder to make that a, uh, a good user experience for the farmer. So if, if we think about what a more optimal version of um, a planting date recommendation might be. So right now, we're doing it kind of at a... Um, five kilometer grid level basically um and so everyone in that five kilometer grid is is getting the same recommendation um but potentially we could get some farmer input into this recommendation right we could ask them about um are you growing in a in a, a valley soil or a slope soil is your soil uh clay or sandy and so we we can build in something around um the kind of soil moisture retention um for that farmer and then we can ask them what variety they're gonna be growing in that season. And again, we can factor that into our model. And so maybe we give them a more specific recommendation. Um, and I think once we start to do that, okay, sure, you, you can try and do that with a, a feature phone um, and get more of that two-way interaction, um, but, but it's difficult to do well. And our experience with that kind of thing is that we just get a lot of people dropping out of, of the interaction halfway through because it's frustrating, the thing times out, um, they mistype uh, a response and so on. And so I think, um, yeah, basically if it's push information, sure, feature phones can, can do the job pretty well. But if we want to have in, uh, real interactions with farmers and get their input in, into the recommendation, um, generally that's gonna mean we want smart things. Um, more complicated than that, but I, I don't wanna go on too much. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, the next question is from Nicholas. Do you think that trust will increase in SMS messages over time? Could local networks of an extension agent be able to send messages and communicate with farmers more efficiently help? Making SMS more personal and a form of trusted source. So I, I think that kind of relates to the last response that you gave, but what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, um, I think, in the case of, of the planting date, SMS specifically, I expect that we will build trust over time. Um, but I mean, here, here's another like good example of, of why we need these complementary systems because um, our model um, where we've identified uh, the kind of uh, sort of optimal predicted soil moisture threshold and confidence threshold um, for us to send a recommendation, we're at about 80% confidence. It varies a bit, but um, that means at any one point, like obviously we're, we're sending a recommendation where there is a 20% likelihood that actually soil moisture is not at the level that we're predicting. Um, and so uh, we're trying to do this in a very scaled, centralized way, but at any one point, there is a risk that we are sending a recommendation to a location where actually soil moisture is not at the critical level. Um, and for a farmer who gets that recommendation just one season, even if we've been right like in eight seasons previously, I think it's game over, <laughs> possibly. Um, like they're not gonna take that recommendation that seriously in future. And so what would be nice is if we actually had a way again to sort of channel that recommendation through somebody who's on the ground in, in that area who can kind of just corroborate what we're seeing in the data. Um, 
anyone who, who's on this call who's uh, got any experience with trying to uh, estimate rainfall based on remote sensing data sets will, will know how, how sketchy that can be. Um, and so, yeah, basically, yeah, I do expect that we will build trust over time until we get it wrong once. Um, and so, again, if we can connect with existing extension workers and use them to kind of corroborate and even somehow deliver and, in, and endorse the recommendations, I think it's going to be much more effective. Cool. Thanks, Deb. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, you mentioned how important it is to get some local information from farmers. You said that you know, collectively, if farmers, farmer groups within a community, we might have, you know, hundreds of years of collective experience farming that piece of land. And I, I'm wondering, have you worked at all in sourcing content and sourcing insights from farmers directly? Um, or have you been mostly working with, you know, pushing out messages from your own or external research? And if you think that would be a viable uh, mechanism for you all, or for just the community in general? David, I'm really sorry. I'm struggling a bit with connection. Um, I'm um, would you mind repeating it, that question? I caught approximately half of it. <laughs> okay. So uh, the question is, uh, what are your thoughts on sourcing content from farmers directly uh, rather than you know, maybe just sourcing content from external sources or even your own internal research? They are mixed. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, th there are some organizations out there doing that. Um, and, and it's not the way that, that we've chosen to go ourselves, um, so far. Um, I do think it's, um, it's a very exciting and, and cool approach. Um, what the likes of, um, we farm are doing, it doesn't work so well for us because uh, at the end of the day, we're not for profit, but you know, but we are, uh, as far as farmers are kind of concerned in, in their interactions with us, we're a business with a brand. And so if we um, kind of provide a platform for farmers to share advice with each other, I think there's some level of risk that the guidance farmers access through there will be attributed to us e either way. Um, and, and I think that's probably going to be true for any sort of similar like scale extension organization. Um, because yeah, farmers, farmers do know a lot, um, and, and can give each other great advice. They can also give each other really bad advice. Um, and, um, and yeah, we see so many, um, yeah, myths passing from farmer to farmer about, the effects of fertilizer on their soil, or um, yeah, the, the effects of lime, or um, misunderstandings about uh, the effects of different spacings on maize cob size and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think my position on it would, would probably be that like, we need to find ways to access that um, all of that data and information and experience, but it probably needs some level of filtering. Um, and I think where farmer um, knowledge and experience tends to be um, most valuable, um, it is more often less to do with the, the what to do or the why to do it and more to do with the how to do it. Um, so if we're you know, giving a recommendation on, um, I don't know. Yeah, so let, let's go with Lyme application. Um, and we say broadcast it. And, and that sounds simple enough, right? Um, but actually, a, a farmer might be wondering, well, should I do it one hand at a time or two hands at a time? Um, and like pr probably other farmers in their area have, have better ideas on that than, than we do. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh... And then maybe another question I would ha I have or a comment and be good to get some of your responses. So you mentioned getting like two to eight percent adoption from your Lyme trial, you know. But if you multiply two to eight percent times, you know, potentially millions of farmers, that's also like pretty substantial number of farmers um, that you might be able to access. 
So then what are, what are your thoughts on some of those trade-offs, you know, um, reaching so many people and if you, you know, reach lots of people, then even a small percentage of points could be really valuable. You know, but also you mentioned that this was coming from Lyme recommendations. And so I imagine that there's a lot of information that's also required and logistics in order to, let's say, deliver Lyme to the specific farmers or even get, you know, more important information about how to, you know, apply the Lyme. And so what are you, some of your thoughts around, around those? Yeah, um, I think uh, one, one point uh, you raised there is kind of <laughs> pretty dear to one acre fund is, is that like giving farmers good recommendations without actually making sure that they're actionable, um, I think is, is a uh, pretty frequent error <laughs> made in, in digital extension services. Um, like we can come up with a great line recommendation, we can come up with fertilizer blend recommendations. Is there anywhere within 50 miles of, of where this farmer lives that they can actually access those things? Um, so yeah, I think if we do not have this kind of like integrated um, bundle of, of services, um, uh, and, and that's not a plug for, for one acre fund, but just like at, at the ecosystem level, if we do not actually like link together all of these pieces, um, we're not really solving anything in, until we've <laughs> solved both the supply and the recommendation. Um, I think I've lost track of, of the, the rest of your questions there, David, sorry. Feel free to repeat. Uh, okay, the next question would be, you know, even a small percentage point of adoption multiplied by, you know, many, many, many farmers is still quite a lot. But hey, let's jump in. There's another question we have from an audience participant from Nicholas. Uh, would communication tools for extension officers uh, to better manage local networks potentially address seasonal peaks inherent in agriculture and open this way to channel uh, to feed in results? Sorry, struggling with connection again, David. Can you repeat that for me? Okay. Uh, it's, so Nick's, Nicholas asks, would communications tools for extension officers to better manage local networks potentially address seasonal peaks inherent in agriculture and open this way to channel to feed in results? Mm. And by, I, I'm not sure what uh, he's, he's meaning there by seasonal peaks. Does he mean seasonal peaks in production? Uh, yeah, potentially maybe like, or uh, yeah, my interpretation of this, and maybe I'm wrong, and Nicholas, if, if, if I'm not getting this wrong, you know, please you know, um, uh, specify in your question. But what about like seasonal, um, seasonal peaks in, in activities, you know, like planting or, or uh, fertilizer timing or, or the different components coming specifically around the planting season? Mm. Yeah, I do think, um, I, apologies, Nicholas, if, if this, this is not uh, well targeted to your, your question, but I do think um, where there are like peak periods of, of activities like um, planting, weeding, top dressing, harvesting and so on. Um, digital can be a, a really incredible tool for an extension worker to reach um, a, a lot of people um, with a, a timely message, um, as opposed to waiting for the next opportunity to, to get a large group of people together. Um, and I think that, yeah, it would be especially true coming back to this idea of kind of real time guidance. Um, we regularly have uh, questions coming in from, from our farmers around um, top dress application. Um, uh, and, uh, and we also often struggle with getting farmers to adopt the, the right top dress application method and timing relative to the crop growth. Um, and then they're also often asking questions about when that should they apply, given that it's been dry for a few weeks and, and so on. Um, and so, um, yeah, something like SMS at that point could be an incredibly valuable way to just give everyone a, a timely reminder of like, yeah, top dress application, it's at the six leaf stage um, and remember how to count. Um, and it's been dry for a couple of weeks and the forecast is still dry for the next week. So actually, you know, don't, don't apply for the next week and so on. Um, so yes, is the answer in my opinion. <laughs> Great, uh, that's all the questions I've got. And Daniel or Berta, any questions for Step? Or, or maybe we could transition to the, to the ending? 
Yeah, I mean, I was just taking notes for the, you know, wrapping up because I was so happy to see all the, pre the presentation, the slides and, and all the points that, that the step um, made. So I think we can wrap up now, right? Um, unfortunately, Tria wasn't able to make it to this webinar, but anyway, like we had a, this very good presentation from STEP and thank you for that. So the idea of this webinar was to explore synergies between digital delivery models and working with farmers group groups. So it was clear from STEP's presentation that one of the traditional ways on that one acre found apply principles of participatory research is through demonstrative plots like control farmers, which in early days of participatory research was called uh, the consultative mode of managing uh, farmer participatory participatory research um, in sorry part, mm, management managing farmer participation in agricultural research. So a step highlighted the, the need and importance of including farmers from the very beginning in this type of research, which is something that we already highlighted on our first webinar of this year when we talk about uh, design thinking. A step has also mentioned how digital information contributes to drive behavior change, but not necessarily be the replacement of face-to-face -face interaction. And that is actually that I keep hearing uh, um, when it was reported by the different communities working on extension advisory services, and that for many farmers in the developing world, in some geographies without any human engagement, they think it's very hard to develop trust. And actually, Step was mentioning, and he emphasized, emphasized that that the um, is like um, over the time we, that we kind of develop this type of trust. But more importantly, a step just confirmed that traditional extension approaches are still very useful. And I agree that whatever the extension method, traditional extension channel is, uh, let's say just to name some of them, farmers field, farmers field school, demonstrative plots, benchmarker, benchmarking, farmer to farmer visits, they're still very useful. And the digital extension tools are just bringing a complementary extra layer of information in a more time sensitive, more site specific, but shouldn't be presented as a replacement of traditional extension channels. And there are new promising avenues like Trico, Timo, uh, that are combining these traditional principles of participatory research and digital approaches. Um, was that correct, Step? <laughs> Did I get you right? Yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good, good. So um, just to remind to all of you that our, West, uh, our next webinar will address the analytic side, the analytic angle, and how collective digital data can be turned into data-driven agronomy, actionable advice, and what's the role of the extension agent of the future using, using these tools and information. So I think that uh, that's it for, um, for today, for our webinar. Uh, thank you, Steph. Thank you, David. Thank you, Berta. <clears throat> and see you on our next webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, bye. Bye bye. Hi everyone, my name is Shreya Agrawal and I'm the Director of Strategy at Digital Green. Digital Green is a nonprofit organization uh, that partners with local organizations and uses technology to increase farmer incomes. So the topic for today is the trade-offs and the synergies in different channels of extension. And I'll be happy to share a little bit about what we've learned since 2008, not only from the context of India and Ethiopia, where we primarily work, but also uh, learnings from a USAID funded project called TLEC, uh, where we've run eight experiments on extension across six countries. So the first question is, who do we work with? We work mainly with smallholder farmers with less than two hectares of land. Uh, these farmers have limited literacy. In India, we primarily work with women. Now, of course, you know that the uh, digital landscape is changing and that uh, especially in India, there's greater access to feature phones, smartphones, as well as data. We also work with extension agents and train them in content, in the use of digital channels and facilitation. Now, traditionally, agricultural extension has focused on face-to-face -face training using approaches like the training and visit system and the farmer field school approach. Now, the problem with these approaches was that uh, it was difficult to scale these 
cost effectively because of poor extension agent to farmer ratios and suffered from low quality in training. Uh, now, with COVID-19 and travel restrictions, uh, face to face training is becoming even more difficult and we are moving towards a more pluralistic extension model. So at Digital Green, uh, we are historically known for the community video approach through which relevant agronomic content is shared via short locally produced videos that are by farmers, for farmers and feature farmers themselves. And they are screened in person in group settings. And this approach has reached close to 2.6 million farmers. 73% of those are women, and we work with 46,000 government extension workers. So what's the impact that this approach has driven? Uh, we've conducted four RCTs, and as per those, uh, it has resulted in up to uh, an increase of 50% uh, adoptions, uh, an increase of up to 46% in yields, 17% uh, in incomes, and that it's especially effective at scale because if you were to compare the cost per adoption for traditional systems versus the video approach, we, we find a 7.6 times improvement. So what are the different learnings that we have that drive this impact? Uh, there are three main learnings, the first of which is the importance of partnerships and social networks. So uh, we have partnered with mainly governments uh, in India with the National Rural Livelihood Missions and in Ethiopia with the Ministry of Agriculture. Now that's been important because only by working through the government system have we been able to uh, create a model that is sustainable uh, and therefore focus on institutionalization of the approach has been key. Um, in fact, the government has invested close to 23 million of its own money, be it on equipment, training, or personnel cost. Now, the other key aspect that's important is that we build on farmer social networks, uh, and those networks usually already exist. So in India, you have women's self-help groups, and then in Ethiopia, farmer development groups created by the government. Now, it's really building on the trust and the social cohesion and the group-based discussions that drives behavior change. And the big question for us has been, how can we replicate that uh, in digital, all digital settings? Because uh, historically, the video work has relied on in-person group settings. So I'll be talking a little bit later about how we've tried to replicate that in digital settings. The second learning is around the importance of local contextualization and identifying positive deviance to build the agency of farmers. And that is why we feature farmers, especially women, in locally developed videos. Facilitation and follow-up by extension agents is also key for high adoption rates. Now, a big part of our approach is focused on reaching the marginalized sections of society, especially women. We've tested how best to engage women uh, so in India and Uganda, we have found that when messages are delivered to women, it increases their knowledge, participation, in decision making, uh, and uh, also adoptions vis-a-vis -vis when they rely on getting that information from their male counterparts. Now, the way we focus on women is, of course, building on these women's social networks, but also ensuring that the content is relevant for women. Uh, by also getting feedback from them and uh, supporting women in participating in leadership positions and governance structures as part of project planning. Third, the, we have learned that farm and farmer level data is needed to make content more targeted and relevant and to ensure that we are not creating top down systems. So farmer first systems rely on incorporating farmer feedback and that is why data is ex exceptionally important. So we have a farmer database of about 2 million farmers with demographic, location and activity based data and this helps inform the next iteration of videos. So in 2010 we started to ask ourselves 
how do we get the data that's helping us back into the hands of farmers and organizations so that it can help them too? How do we catalyze the data sharing ecosystem? Uh, and the big part of this was our push towards data sovereignty. We therefore developed FarmStack. FarmStack is an open source protocol which relies on peer-to-peer -peer data sharing so that organizations can define their own usage control policies and in this way securely share data on their own terms. Now FarmStack enables this exchange uh, so that it can support other platforms, other applications, uh, and it, it provides an input to those as opposed to an alternative. Uh, and therefore, it's one part of the stack uh, under a new or an existing infrastructure. Finally, uh, getting to the question of how do these other channels fit in, right? We have in-person channels, IVR, SMS, you name it. So we've learned that it's really integrating channels that can amplify impact as opposed to treating them as competing uh, approaches. So uh, as you'll see here, uh, we, especially with COVID-19 tested, the moving our in-person meetings to digital channels uh, and we've, experimented with IVR, SMS, as well as online communities on WhatsApp. So we did a study in Andhra Pradesh where in addition to in-person videos, we added a layer of IVR. Uh, and we found that that led to a 21% increase in adoption versus just sharing the content via video. So it's really the reinforcement mechanism which was particularly impactful. The other area of experimentation is developing digital online communities, and we've done that on WhatsApp. So uh, rather than sharing content one-on-one, -on -one, what we tried to do was mirror our in-person social groups to that of WhatsApp groups. And these WhatsApp groups were facilitated by the extension agents themselves because of what we learned is that Trusted facilitation is an important part of behavior change. But in addition to that, we also tested chatbots. Now, a chatbot is a computer program that is designed to simulate a human conversation. And we found that uh, communities actually found chatbots easy and convenient to use. And this was true both for men and women. However, there were some pitfalls, like, for example, difficulty in onboarding farmers and in actually training the chatbot to be able to respond to different questions and scenarios. Um, and uh, other aspects that are important to highlight is that women usually have lower access to uh, mobile phones and therefore a big part of our work has been in trying to increase uh, ways in which we can uh, increase access for women to these digital mobile based extension. Some of the learnings there have been uh, the popularity of voice messages. Uh, and that's something that women especially find helpful. The other is that when we're using uh, IVR, encouraging households to listen to messages on speaker phones, and that way increasing uh, the access to, to that particular content. So on the whole, our uh, big takeaways is that uh, as long as our channels of advice and decision support are farmer first, uh, recognizing that technology really isn't a silver bullet and rather an amplifier, that the human element is important and that means working with existing partners, recognizing that peer-to-peer -peer learning is important and therefore featuring uh, local champions, uh, leveraging social networks that already have trust and social cohesion, and then finally ensuring local contextualization are all key aspects of behavior change. Data is a great amplifier, especially given the context and need for greater precision uh, information because of climate change. So uh, leveraging that and ensuring that it really 
increases data sovereignty by giving farmers and organizations not only control of their data, but also providing them with choice on how they use it to increase the uh, quality uh, of services that they can, can access. And then finally, uh, it's really the integration of channels that can increase impact and uh, rather than viewing it as competing frameworks, we can find strategies of using them as reinforcing mechanisms. So with that, a big thank you and uh, looking forward to future conversations.